recalling that fateful warm Viennese day of 4th of December 1938 in the interview he gave to the AJR's Refugee Voices, Otto Hutter characteristically described. At about four o'clock, I was on my way back across the Marienbrucke, within a hundred yards or so of our house, when coming the other way was a friend of mine, Bobby Mutz. And as we passed, he says, hello Otto, bye bye, I'm off to England this week. And I said, how on earth are you going off to England? How do you do it? He said, well, children are being registered in the Hotel Metropole. That was the Gestapo headquarters to go to England. Well, the Hotel Metropole, you know, it's just around the corner, a couple of squares away. So I turned around and ran to the hotel and joined the queue. It was an elaborate procedure. I underwent a medical examination and overall general questions. And in the end was handed papers telling me whatever I needed to take with me in my suitcase and that there would be a transport at the end of the week. But of course, all this had taken until about eight o'clock in the evening, and I hadn't told my parents anything. I mean, I should have gone home and told them what Bobby Mutz had told me, but my reflex was to act immediately. And just as well as I did, because I had taken the initiative, I was number 359 out of 360 recruited that day. And quite honestly, if I hadn't, I don't suppose I ever would have gotten out for two reasons. First, time was essential. Secondly, in the later transports, people had to have a guarantor. Somebody had to be prepared to take them. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome and thank you for joining us for today for our commemoration of Holocaust Memorial Day. My name is Michael Newman. I'm the Chief Executive of the AJR and I would like to extend a warm and special welcome to our members and their families as well as colleagues and friends representing organizations the AJR supports and works closely with. International Holocaust Memorial Day has instilled in society the importance of the act of remembrance and enables everyone the chance to reflect on the lives that were lost and of the rich Jewish culture and customs that were destroyed, of the centuries of learning that vanished. The theme for Holocaust Memorial Day this year is Be the Light in the Darkness, which also presents us with an opportunity to consider what we all as individuals can do to honour and remember and to teach and learn. And so, while Providence played a role in Otto's escape, that first Austrian kinder transport on 10th of December 1938 was organised by Gertrude Weissmuller Meyer, the Dutch resistance fighter, who negotiated directly with Eichmann and is thought to have saved up to 10,000 children from the fate that befell millions during the Second World War. The Kinder transport was a chink of light as Europe succumbed to Nazi oppression. And while some 10,000 mostly Jewish children found refuge here, thanks to the generosity of strangers who provided the guarantees, one and a half million children perished. The light in the darkness were the townsfolk of Venlo in the Netherlands who handed out chocolate to the cheering children on the kinder transport as they crossed over from Germany. To the officials who issued visas by the thousand, enabling Jews to flee Nazi Germany and Austria. To the Quakers who facilitated those journeys. To those who hid their neighbours and to those who resisted like Sophie and Hans Scholl and their fellow White Rose members. It also extends to those in this country who opened their doors to kinder and those who gave employment to people who came on domestic visas. In this, the 80th anniversary of the year, year of the AJR, it is not only individuals whose altruism should be venerated. Organisations too played a role. With the horrors fresh in their minds, the refugees who founded the AJR in 1941 and began publishing the AJR Journal in January 1946, since when it has been produced uninterruptedly, paved the way for Holocaust remembrance today and in the future from documenting contemporaneous accounts to the placing of harrowing search notices. Speaking in schools, much as their parents and grandparents did, the second and third generations have a unique perspective to share that sheds light not only on the human stories of the Holocaust, but also its legacy in our society today. 
And so it can be said that those who take up the mantle of, of family heritage and remembrance are themselves exemplifying the theme of being the light in the darkness. Because as we move from living to documented history, narratives and narratives, we are mindful that we live today in a world where truth is expendable and where the pursuit and discovery of historical fact is outweighed by the desire to engage to preserve a national narrative. And so our mission takes on a new dimension to engage in innovative ways. Equally, we must be unafraid to engage in critical thinking so that Holocaust denial and distortion can be challenged and exposed for the anti-Semitism it, it attempts to conceal. And so these first-hand accounts like Otto's and those we will hear today are also an invaluable resource to combat anti-Semitism and the growing phenomenon of Holocaust distortion. A topic addressed by the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance with the launch last week of their global task force recommendations for recognizing and countering Holocaust distortion. Evincing the message of never again on Holocaust Memorial Day, it is also our duty to speak out about the plight of other communities who also suffered at the hands of the Nazis, including the Roma, the disabled, the homosexuals and those whose political views threatened the Nazi worldview. And also those who were similarly persecuted in subsequent genocides in Cambodia, Rwanda, Bosnia and Darfur, and those who at this very moment are the targets of oppression, including the Uyghur Muslims in China. In a moment, to begin our service, we will see a short film of six AGR volunteers lighting memorial candles. Six people from among the 300 selfless individuals who have become our light in recent months by befriending and supporting our members, by helping them to connect to our activities, by capturing their stories, and above all, by being a point of contact. At the request of Holocaust Memorial Day Trust, we encourage everyone to light a candle and put it in your window tomorrow evening in remembrance and to shine a light against prejudice and hatred today. To lead us in prayers and to share his thoughts, we will then hear from Rabbi Stuart Altshuler in the Belsize Square Synagogue. And as he will shortly be leaving his position, I would like to take this opportunity to thank Stuart for officiating at our events over many years and for the spiritual support he has given. If you have not already received a programme for this service, you can find it on the homepage of our website. The best way to watch this service is by selecting Speaker View. And please note this service is being recorded and will be available to watch again alongside our other recent events on our YouTube channel. Lastly, let me also take the opportunity to remind you to please be in touch if you or anyone you know could benefit from our social welfare services and support. Thank you. Adonai Machem, may God's presence be with all of you as we are here together on this Holocaust Memorial Day. And thank you for your wonderful uh, remarks, Michael, for your wonderful leadership and friendship through the years. We are here to find the light, the comfort, the strength, the faith in the midst of darkness, as our theme is this year, be the light in the darkness. We all recognize that despite <clears throat> what we remember, the Shoah, the darkest, darkest nightmare in the history of humanity, 
and that there is still darkness and injustice in the world. So much sorrow, especially at this time. Renewed violence, hatred, libels against our people and against goodness. Looking back at the years of the Shoah, we know that the darkness of the Shoah was mostly caused not just by the perpetrators of murder, but also by lethal silence. As the Torah we read this past Shabbat said regarding the ninth of the 10 plagues in Egypt, the plague of Hosheth of darkness, it was not a physical darkness that we read about, but a moral and spiritual darkness that pervaded over Egypt. Velo kamu ish mi that there was such a darkness that people couldn't get up to help their fellow human being. And but for Israel, there was light in their dwellings. As Ivan in Dostoevsky's Brothers Karamazov said, quote, It is not God who I cannot believe. It is his world that I cannot believe. It is humanity, not God that created the darkness. And so where do we find the light? The light that resided among the people of Israel in ancient Egypt. I dare say that it is, we've already heard in those human beings, Jews, Christians, Muslims, atheists, others, who risked their lives and limbs to rescue the hunted and tortured. These righteous, who as the Torah says, rose up kamu mitachtav and defied darkness must never be forgotten by us. It is the light of Father Pierre-Marie Benoit, a black bearded, brown robed capuchin monk who knew that the opposite of goodness is indifference, that there was only one way to resist darkness, and that was to be the light unto others. He, one man, transformed his monastery in Marseille into a passport mill, issuing hundreds of ID cards, hundreds of false certificates of baptism, given to unbaptized Jews. Those hundreds were smuggled into Spain and Switzerland to freedom. He saved, according to the rest of what he did, approximately 50,000 French Jews who went to Morocco, Algiers, and Tunisia. He fled to the Italian zone in Nice. He was ultimately captured by the Nazis. He was arrested. He was tortured. He was finally freed and he escaped to Italy where he was proudly called father of the Jews. Father Benoit exemplifies the light and the darkness, the power of the human spirit to say absolutely no to darkness, who saw as we recognize today the light of the godliness of those who gave our people a piece of bread, a cup of water, a shelter in the attic, or in a sewer or a latrine to stay in. We remember the darkness of the Shoah. No period in history was darker. To deny this evil is blindness, to feign deafness. We comfort each other, therefore, through our tears today, knowing it did not have to be this way. Because we have hope, for we know that humanity can still be the arms, legs, and mouth of God, of light. The first thing God created, says in the book of Genesis, Breshit, Vayahi Or, there was light. Light, the recognition of the goodness he was going to implant, the image of God that still lies waiting in humanity still. Let light, that light, 
penetrate the darkness today and forever. Amen. Thank you very much, Stuart, as ever, for those uh, inspiring words. We will now hear the thoughts of Bart Van Es about the fate of his family and to read from his acclaimed book, The Cutout Girl, one of the earliest recorded Zoom events uh, that I mentioned is on the AGL's YouTube channel. Hello, my name is Bart Van Ness, and it's an honour to be part of this act of remembrance by the AJR. I've been asked to say a little bit about my grandparents, about whom I wrote a book and who were part of the resistance in the Netherlands during World War II. I know that your theme this year is light in darkness, and that's a pretty difficult thing to find when you look at what happened in the Netherlands, which had around 154,000 Jews in 1941 when the country was invaded and 107,000 of those ended up being sent to the death camps in the east. But I suppose if we do look at something like the story of my grandparents, um, there is something there to give us comfort about what human beings are capable of. And I've also been asked to read a little bit from my book the Cutout Girl, which tells the story of Lean, the girl who was one of those they saved and whom I first met in 2014, and who is, I think, another point of light because now, aged 87, she is still an absolutely remarkable person, a very positive person, and one of my dearest friends. So I think the thing that I would most want to say about my grandparents were that they were people with something bigger than themselves to shape their lives. And I ultimately think that it was that sense of being part of something larger, which didn't have to be, as it was in their case, a political party. It could have been a church. It could have been a social group. But that sense of being part of something bigger, I think, was what allowed them to act. My grandmother was uh, the child of poor agricultural workers. My grandfather was uh, a factory worker, and they got to know each other in the Dutch Labour Party. Very largely, people in the Netherlands, I think, found it very difficult to act to save their Jewish neighbours uh, once the Nazi state took over the Netherlands. But from very early on, um, it was their connections to um, a group of fellow political idealists um, that allowed my grandfather in particular to become active in the resistance and that made it possible for them um, to take lean into their lives in August 1942. They were, they were tough people, I think, practical minded. Um, my mother, my grandmother was very, very good with children, uh, not sentimental, but extremely fair. And I think it's that combination of practicality and fairness that really helped save Lean. When Lean came to them, uh, she was a very outgoing uh, and happy little girl, and she bonded uh, very quickly with uh, the family with whom she was now able to live um, openly under a new identity. And she became very close in particular uh, to my uncle. And after the war, a much more damaged, um, a much more sensitive girl came back to the family having spent a certain amount of time away from them uh, during the latter parts of the war, when the place where they lived, Dordrecht, became too dangerous uh, to hide a Jewish girl. And that second phase of looking after Lean, I think, is also an important part of the story of survival, which is not just a matter of getting to the year 1945. It's also a matter of surviving uh, with the trauma of everything that happened during the war and, and the loss of her family and an entire culture that came with it. Um, my grandmother often said to me, we were not brave. What were you going to do if someone left a child at your door? It seems in a lot of ways an absurd thing to say that they were not brave. Researching their lives 
made it all the more apparent to me how astonishingly brave they were because I got to realize that this wasn't the war for them. This was forever. And it seemed inconceivable uh, that the Nazis would be defeated in 1942. Um, and the chances that they would be discovered uh, felt overwhelming. But still, I can see a little bit of what she meant when she said uh, that what were you going to do if someone left a child at your door. I think that moment where the child was given to them, it was because they were part of a network where people expected this of them uh, that allowed them to act. And very often the stories of those who took part in the resistance that I investigated as part of my story of what happened in the Netherlands uh, were those who had just one tiny point of connection to the world of their Jewish neighbours that then uh, made them feel involved and part of something bigger. So I'm going to read a little bit from the book from very early on. This is the moment where Lean is collected uh, from her parents' house in The Hague and brought to my grandparents. In the morning, soon after she has had her bread and cheese, there is a lady at the door, even grander than Mrs. Andreessen, and not so old. She has a firm, jolly manner, just like the nurse at the doctor's surgery, saying nice things about her and asking questions about her schoolwork and about what books she enjoys. Lean is embarrassed that she does not do much reading, though she remembers to say that she likes young Klasse and Katrine. The lady is quite young, but not at all like a mother. It is a real adventure to be going with her, the kind of adventure that gives you a little feeling of sickness in your mouth. On the outside, she is excited, but on the inside, she feels calm. They are unstitching the stars from her dresses, the two women's fingers moving very fast. Lean can keep her own name and her surname, de Jong, but she must not say anything about mama or papa or family. She is not to be Jewish now, just a normal girl from Rotterdam, whose parents have been killed in the bombing. If anyone asks, she must say that the lady is Mrs. Hirama, and that she is taking her to her aunt, who lives in Dordrecht, which is a different town. It is important to stay very close to the lady, hug tight into her body, so that nobody who knows her can see that Lean is not wearing her star. Mama says exactly the same things as the lady, and gets her to repeat them, even though Lean feels she knows them already. Then a kiss with a hug that hurts a little, and she is outside in the Pleteraistrand, walking fast in step with the lady trying hard to keep herself pressed into her coat. The bag of her things, including her Pussy album and Papa's puzzle, is over Mrs. Hirama's shoulder and bangs its edge against her with every stride. It is not far from Lean's house to the station, so they walk through the streets and then through the park, where Jews are forbidden, to the Hollandspoor railway, is over almost as soon as it starts. The station front looks like a palace, but there is no time to look at it, because their train is about to depart. Lean thinks for a moment about her bedroom, close enough for her to run back. Mrs. Hirama talks to her about funny place names. There are lots in Holland, she says. For example, the Double Sausage Street in Amsterdam, the Moustache in Groningen, or Duxit Road in Zealand. There is also a road called Behind the Wild Pig. Lean thinks these names are funny, she likes Mrs. Hirama, and giggles as they watch the houses of The Hague pass faster and faster through the window of the train compartment, the ka-chunk, ka -chunk of the wheels on the railway growing louder and closer together. The smoke from the locomotive is dirty, but it smells clean. Does Lean know any funny place names? After a lot of thinking, she remembers Cowthief Street, which Mrs. Hirama had not known about. Cowthief Street, that's a good one. Mrs. Hirama says. Lean is about to say, it's not far from our house, when she stops herself, just in time. Unlike The Hague, Dordrecht has only one railway station. It is also like a palace, only a bit smaller, without the princess towers of the station they left behind. They walk through another park, bigger than theirs at home, and sleepy in the afternoon sunlight, then through streets with little houses, nothing at all like the three-storey apartment blocks of The Hague. Her legs are tired now, 
and it takes a bit longer each time to get to a new corner. But at each one, Mrs. Hirama tells her the street name, and then a funny one from somewhere else in Holland. So Lean presses on. All the houses that Linus passed seemed little compared to the ones in The Hague. But the final ones in the Builder de Extrat are the littlest, littlest of all. In fact, the street doesn't really look like it has houses. It just has two long, low, red brick walls with doors and windows set in it, stretching as far as Lean can see. In the road, a group of boys is running and shouting. Mrs. Hirama, ignoring the commotion, walks straight to the door of number 10 and knocks hard on the little round window pane. In her coat pocket, unbeknownst to Lean, there is a letter. It is written in the same steady hand that her mother used on the second page of the little girl's album. The letter, which still survives in Lean's apartment in Amsterdam, is dated August 1942. It reads as follows. Most honoured sir and madam, although you are unknown to me, I imagine you for myself as a man and a woman who will as a father and mother, care for my only child. She has been taken from me by circumstance. May you, with the best will and wisdom, look after her. Imagine for yourself the parting between us. When shall we ever see her again? On the 7th of September, she will be nine. I hope it will be a joyful day for her. I want to say to you that it is my wish that she will think only of you as her mother and father and that, in the moments of sadness that will come to her, you will comfort her as such. If God wills it, we will all, after the war, shake one another by the hand in joyous reunion, directed to you as the father and mother of Lintia. Well, she was looked after by them, and I think that is a point of light in, in the darkness, even if it was not possible. Uh, for her parents to be saved, and I think of them at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Bart. After our next film, we encourage you to join us as Cantor Paul Heller from the Belsai Square Synagogue leads us in the El Malay Rachamim. But it now gives me great pleasure to introduce the film conversation between two BAFTA winners, AGR member Stephen Frank and his granddaughter Maggie Fleet, who recall together the trip they made to the Netherlands, the Czech Republic and Poland for the award-winning film, Finding My Family, Holocaust. Maggie, why did you want to go on this journey? Um, I thought it'd be a really unique experience and it was very interesting to go to almost like retrace your steps because I feel like quite a lot of people have been to Holland and then come back and then a different on a different occasion been to Prague and then come back. It was quite interesting to go from place to place like similar to the way you travelled and um, yeah it was a really good experience as well to see what you went through and how quickly it changed because there was like the beautiful house in Amsterdam and then when we went to the camp in Theresien it was like a direct contrast kind of thing. Well that's right I mean it, it was very interesting for me to do something like this um, with you you know you're the you know the up and coming generation and I'm the sort of outgoing generation and to go back to Holland then of course first of all to to see the, uh, the life before the war and, and, and how things were. I and mean, you know, we went down the canals and things and we talked about, you know, the, um, the beautiful houses on the sides of the canals and things. And then, of course, you know, the, we had the invasion um, and the Germans occupied Holland. And then suddenly, for, um, you know, I suddenly became aware that I was just different from, from other children in, in the area where I was living. And then it was made even more um, obvious when um, we had to wear a badge, a star, you know, like uh, this one here that I've got still have. It's got the word yoke written on it. As you can see, it still has the bits of cotton attached to where my mother took it off our clothing at the end of the war. She realized that we were living history and that this thing should be kept. 
And, you know, yeah, then we were in Holland. And um, while we were there, we went to all these places. And uh, I remember particularly well um, going down past the Anne Frank house on the boat. Uh, yeah. And then, of course, you know, we went into that museum, you know, the Fazetz Museum, which is a sort of a occupation museum, if you like, in Amsterdam, where you, you had a very interesting conversation there with the curator that was there, didn't you? Yeah, he showed me how the kind of passport things he forged, because if you're a Jew, you had the black J on it and they carefully aligned the pieces of paper so that you could pretend you weren't Jewish. And it was quite interesting, one of the forgeries and stuff and how like the police would find out if you forged it if that makes sense and that mm. was interesting can't imagine having to do something like that pretending you're someone you're not it's weird yeah you had to sort of live a lie and of course it was it was much more difficult for young children you know, to do that for children who went into hiding for example who went to live with non-jewish um, um parents so to speak um and um who and they had to pretend that something that they weren't that must have been extremely difficult and then of course you know after the sort of um blissfully happy childhood that i had in holland and we, we were saw our old house where we lived then the occupation and then from there we we, we, we moved on to uh to Regenstadt. and suddenly of course this was a completely different um, sort of environment and perhaps you'd like to to remember or remind me of what you thought about that? It was a unique place. It was very, very pretty on the outside. And then as soon as you went in to where the camp would have been, it was quite still. And there was still life, but a lot less life to when you went outside to where the camp wouldn't have been. And then with the kind of replicas and seeing the conditions that you all had to live in, that's horrible. I just remember the story about you telling me the person on the top bunk weeing through and it had come down because they were so scared and it had come down onto all the other people. And I, nobody of my generation could imagine doing that every night. That's, you shouldn't have had to do that. Mm -hmm. Well, yes, the poor chap. I mean, he was he was deeply traumatized in the you know in the environment in which we were living, and you know we, we all had to react to these sort of in environments in our own um, way, the best way we could. And, and of course, we did make up games with our with our um, friends in the, because we were taken away from my mother when we when we got into Theresia South, and we were in a Dutch children's home. And we played games, you know, with with our fellow inmates, if you like, of the children's home, uh, and um, people reacted in very different ways uh, while we were, while we were in there. And of course, you know, you just saw starvation there, and you and you saw death all the time, you know. You, and even today, you know, I feel I'm sort of desensitized to death. Um, to a certain extent, because of the the experiences of what we witnessed while while we were in the camps, um, and um, unfortunately, some of the places that I wanted to revisit when we were in Teresian Stout, they changed all the names now, of course, because it is after all a Czech town, so all the street names are in Czech, um, which makes it extremely difficult. Because when I was there, of course, all the street names were in German. And when we went to have a look at the, the children's home where I was, um, in fact, we couldn't find it. And it looked as if it had been actually demolished and turned into a car park. Um, but we did see the, the tunnel where I worked or the entrance to the tunnel where I worked and, and moved the, the ashes of the dead right near the end of the war. Uh, we saw that and that was a sort of pretty grim um, reminder of what it was like and of course as you got nearer the end of the war it got worse didn't it mm. so what did you think about all that it was quite horrific to see that when you put the story and the scenes together it made it worse because it was like you remember that tunnel as passing the ashes along from the dead and so did quite a few other people whereas people today would just go through that tunnel like nothing's there they're just completely unaware. It might even be their favourite tunnel, whereas you have that memory of the place. And it's 
it's not upsetting that they demolished the camp, but I feel like they should have kept a bit more of it so that people from today can now understand what you went through in a deeper sense. Yeah. And I can remember when we, we walked together uh, on the railway line into the Asienstadt, that very railway line that brought me there in a cattle truck. And, you know, the, the different feelings that, of course, I had of walking on that railway track as opposed to the, the feelings uh, that you had. Um, yeah. That was something quite different. And then, of course, you know, I mean, I was the lucky one. I was the one that survived because after that, we went on to... Auschwitz and we went by taxi to Auschwitz and you know we went by taxi to Auschwitz and all those other people we know went in cattle trucks to Auschwitz and it took us many many hours uh, to get there and can you remember what it was like when we visited uh, Birkenau that very early morning that early sunny misty morning? There was no life there like there were no birds no insects nothing it was just deadly still <clears throat> there was kind of like just like this like aroma that death had been there sort of spread around the area and everything was just deadly so, still and it was so silent and quiet mm. and i think we were extremely grateful for the for the bbc who got it so well organized because we had a wonderful guide who'd actually um, done a bit of research and found out the, 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 the gas chamber where my father was gassed in Auschwitz. And uh, that was a very, very um, moving moment while we were there, because right next door to the, what was it called again, the, the White Cottage? Yeah. Uh, next door to it, there was a memorial uh, where the ashes had been scattered. Um, and then um, we stood at that memorial together and that was a, probably the most moving part of our whole journey there together. And yeah, you... I think it summarised the trip well in the sense that you were like very lucky that you managed to survive, but for millions, that was their destiny and that was where they ended up. So the majority of people who ever went through a camp most ended up at Auschwitz, but even if they didn't, they still would have been through similar trauma. Mm, yeah, yeah. Mm. And at least we, we did have the, if you can call it the satisfaction of being able to have some sort of closure on the deaths of those members of my family who died there by laying a stone uh, for each of those members on that memorial. Um, and um, it sort of, closed it off for us, well, for me anyway. Um, and I can always, I can still hear these words say, coming through out of my mouth, something saying, um, um, how would you say, uh, for, for you, this is history, but for me, it was life. Yeah. And, you know, it was a bit, a bit like that. And, um, and then, Let's go back now to the sort of the whole experience of, of, of the whole trip. Um, what is it about it that made you feel um, the most, most moving thing or the most memorable thing for you? Um, I think the most moving part was laying the stones at Auschwitz because I think we're very lucky that because we know people who died there, whereas some people can't trace their family line and are just presuming they died there but because we know they did it was nice to have some kind of closure on it mm. and yeah that was probably the most moving part and can you remember um, with the guide when we were going uh, when we were in Birkenau about the shoes can you remember what she said um, about the shoes that we saw there there's hundreds of shoes that was really really sad man. but you saw all of the shoes of the people who'd come and then she was saying how you could tell if the person who'd come was from a family where they'd been in poverty or from a rich family because some people had like bright red high heels and other people had sort of like woven sandals with sort of like a hay kind of thing. Mm, yeah yeah you suddenly began to realize that there was a whole spectrum of um yeah people you who could, could be um, taken there. It, 
made it so that you could relate to a person there because it wasn't like some it was it wasn't like it was all of this group of people all of that group of people it was like they're just like everybody else yes i think it was it was a memorable experience for me i think it was a memorable experience to be there with you the younger generation and um yes it's something that i shall never forget yeah Oh, 
Stephen and Maggie uh, and Canto Heller. Our next film features the interview AGR member Eve Wilman gave to her great niece, Gabriella Wilman. Eve's story has also been captured for posterity in one of the AGR's My Story books, a collection of personal keepsakes that can be used as an educational resource. And you can download for free and see information about all the books in this collection at ajrmystory.org.uk. My name is Eve Wilman, although I was born Ava, uh, and the, the Wilman uh, has two, had two ends. Asked, um, but during my experiences coming to England, I'm now Eve Wilman, and I came on a kinder transport in April 1939. I'm here with my great niece, Gabriella Wilman, uh, who's going to ask me a few questions about my former life. Hi, I'm Gabby, and a couple of months ago, I did a school project where I spoke to Eve over the phone about her journey when she came over to um, England from the Kinder, from Austria. Um, so Eve, can you tell me about um, how the journey was? Uh, well, Gabby, um... As you know, I was only five years old, and uh, at and at five years old, uh, one doesn't necessarily remember much. But also, because it was such a bad experience, um, I think my mind didn't want to remember it. But um, I came on on Vienna on a kinder transport train with an older girl. She was five, six years older than I was. We weren't related, uh, blood related, but um, her grandfather married my grandfather's sister. And so uh, she knew the family well. So what I know about the journey I mainly know what she has told me. And the, the main thing she told me was that I held her hand tight all the way and I didn't want to let her go. The, um, the main thing one can remember about traveling in a train in those days, it was a steam train and so it was very noisy. Uh, you could hear the, the wheels on traveling on the rails. And so we settled down in the train until we came to the border of Holland when the train stopped and there was a huge clatter uh, whistles blowing and the wooden doors opened and we were afraid that German soldiers would be coming in because they had come at various stops during the journey. But um, they, this time they weren't German soldiers. They were very kind ladies, Dutch ladies, who brought us hot sweet drinks 
And for some reason, I remembered it was orange juice, but people are telling me it wasn't, it was hot chocolate. And so we had the hot chocolate and the train went further and further. I can't remember much more about it until we arrived at Liverpool Street Station in London, where we were met by one of my uncles who had already come to England on a visa. Because the theme for Holocaust Memorial Day is Be the Light in the Darkness, who and what were the lights in your experience? The, the light was, although I went to several foster about four different foster families, one of the families uh, were extremely kind to me and treated me like their own child. I lived in a beautiful house and it, they, they had a son the same age as I was and a beautiful dog and it was a happy experience for me to, to start school. I, I then went to a small private school in Cambridge and um, one of my happy moments was I was the first person in the class to finish learning all the times tables. But um, I, I couldn't stay uh, with this family because one of my uncles who had come to England had been a rabbi in Moravia and he was very unhappy that uh, I was losing my Jewish identity and so I had to leave this happy family to go to another family in Cambridge who weren't so kind to me. And this is a time of darkness because although I was so young, the lady that looked after me decided I should be a housemaid. And she gave me lots of housework to do as well as going to school and one of the horrible things was uh, she was a Scottish lady and there was porridge every morning and I had to wash the porridge pots. And from this day on, I can't face porridge. <laughs> I, uh, the... Jewish Refugee Committee, who are now World Jewish Relief, um, they looked after me. They, they kept a full record of what was happening. And it's quite amazing. I have all the records of what I have had done since I've been in England. Uh, most of it handwritten, because in 19... 39, 40s, there weren't computers to type it out. <coughs> uh, I, I then went to a Jewish family, uh, although I then went to a, a lovely school, South Hampstead High School, were evacuated uh, in, in this place, Berkhamstead. And we had Jewish prayers once a week because there were so many Jewish children there then. And um, I started to become more Jewish then. But the, the main light of this whole thing was when my uncle, the rabbi, he 
and his wife, they lived in a small place in the northeast of England called West Hartlepool. And when he was established there, well, the World Jewish Relief then allowed me to go and live with him. And that moment was the, the light of the whole journey because although in my foster homes, they were large, beautiful mansions, my uncle and aunt, because they had come from Europe and they were living in furnished accommodation at the time. But to go and live with them was the happiest thing that could possibly happen to me. My uncle and aunt were just so loving and, and so encouraging. And it was just the most beautiful experience. I was so lucky. Wow, that was so fascinating to learn about your journey. Do you have any messages that you would like to tell the younger generations? Well, I, I would like everybody to know what had happened and to, to make sure it could never happen again because I, I, nev I would never ever want parents to have to send their children away on a journey, not knowing whether they would ever see them again. Gabby, can I ask you what you have learned from my story and what you would like to tell people about it? Well, I've learned that despite what you're going through, there's always something that will keep you going and um, at the end it will all um, work out okay and you should never give up when times are tough. And when I presented your story to my school, everybody, I could tell that um, everyone was really interested in how life was different back then, especially for you and how you got through the journey. Abby, I'd, I'd just like to thank you for listening to my story uh, because, you know, it's it's not everybody that's interested and, and you've listened and you've asked me such deep questions and it was just a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed hearing about it. Thank you, Eve uh, and Gabriella. Uh, our last film today is an excerpt from the Refugee Voices interview given by Selma van der Perra that will be introduced by our project director, Dr. Bear Lefkowitz. As with the My Story books, you can delve into the archive of these film testimonies at ajrrefugeevoices.org.uk. Bear? It is my honor to address you briefly today on the eve of Holocaust Memorial Day 2021. As many of you will know, we started collecting interviews for the AJR Refugee Voices Archive in 2003, 18 years ago. 18 is the Hebrew number for Chai, life, and through the work of our archive, we will ensure that the personal and collective story of our interviewees will stay alive in our new digital world for perpetuity. For me, all the interviewees who have shared their memories of their lives and their losses are true examples of lights in the darkness. Today, I'd like to honor them and their families. This year's theme for Holocaust Memorial Day is an imperative. It asks us all to, quote, be the light in the darkness. We've chosen to share the testimony of 98-year-old Selma van der Pere, 
whose life and words exemplify this call for action. At the end of our socially distant garden interview last summer, Selma said, and I quote, I don't believe in words only. I mean, you hear people at the moment, for instance, so often words, so many words, instead of action. And I think you should act and you should act how you feel without trying to hurt other people. That's the main thing. Whatever you do, try not to hurt other people. We've just heard from Bart van Es, who told us about Linda Young Spiro, who was hidden through the help of the Dutch resistance and his grandparents. This was also the case for Selma, then 20 years old. In 1942, Selma moved to Leiden, where she found shelter in the house of Antje Holthaus, who was part of a group of doctors in the resistance. Selma joined them and worked for the Dutch resistance for almost two years under the Christian name of Margaret von der Kaut. She courageously delivered letters, reports, food stamps, and false identity papers across Holland. Selma's life story, like so many others we collected, testify to the darkness of our interviewees' experiences, resulting from prejudice, antisemitism, and racism. But they also testify and shine a light on the courage and fortitude displayed by many organizations and individuals. And I should say that I'm delighted that Selma is with us today. Uh, maybe you can spot her in one of the screens. And if you want to write any messages, we will pass, pass them on to her. Let us take inspiration from the words of our interviewees. I'd like to finish with Psalm 34, verse 15, which Professor Ludwig Finkelstein quoted in his interview. Sur mera ve tov, vake shalom verat pehu. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. Let us now watch a short extract of Selma's interview. Thank you. My name is Selma van der Per, born in June, the 7th of June, 1922, in Amsterdam, Holland, the Netherlands. And the war had broken out in May, 5th of May, 1940. We had German um, parachutists coming down in Amsterdam and the German army entering Holland. And they fought for four days. And, um, my, and then Holland capitulated. And that was Heller. That was very bad, of course, very, very bad, yes. That's when we started feeling it, yes. And very nervous. Oh, yeah, my father had his call up. And the Jewish, uh, Jewish uh, uh, council had said, and the rumors as well, that if the man goes to work, wife and children will be free. So my father went. And the, he went to the work camp in Drenthe. And the same evening, they were sent on to Westerbork, which was the Durchgangs lager for... Yeah. Uh, which was a transit And camp. that same evening, I could hear all the heavy boots of the soldiers and the police, German and Dutch, fetching people out of their house. Terrible, terrible, all that noise, screaming. You were, and, uh, where were you at the time? I, we were asleep at home. I was asleep at home with my sister in the bed, double bed we had. And your mother was there? And my mother was there as well, of and course. And your father yeah. already left? My father was in the camp, therefore, yes, yes. And so they did, <laughs> I had curls pale, I had curls, made curls in my hair, and I quickly took them out just in case they came. Just in case they came for us, you see. Unbelievable. You had the rolls, you mean the, rolls, the plastic? Yeah, that's right. Unbelievable the things you think of at that moment. And you thought if you if you have to go I don't want those girls in my hair, yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But they didn't come for us that evening, thank God. Otherwise I wouldn't be sitting here. Um so I said to my mother, they'll come for us tomorrow or the day after. Well, what can we do? And so I said, well, we have to go 
in hiding. But I went to stay with Mientje and Antje. Mien and Antje. And Antje was the assistant of Wimstorm in the hospital. And Mien was in laboratory, laboratories. And uh, I, when the Germans started looking for Wimstorm, when he got too hot, he had to go into hiding himself. He did travel a lot and still help people a lot, but he had to go and take away from his job. And Antje, uh, she was only 23, Antje Holthuis took over his job as head of the genealogical department. This was a very interesting job. And the doctor, the doctors had already quite an resistance movement there, which when I came there I didn't know. I knew one or two were in it, but not the movement itself. Um, several of the doctors came to eat often with us, and because we lived in a big canal house, you know, one of those big houses, huge front room. And after a while they were telling stories about resistance workers who had been imprisoned or because and at that time they just started, the Germans just started to call up non-Jewish boys and girls for work in Germany. And so several of them, and also some of them who went to, wanted to go to university had to sign a loyalty paper, loyal to the German ID. And they didn't do it, several of them, and they went into hiding then. So you had quite a lot of non-Jewish boys and girls, boys and men, who needed provision of cards and photographs and things like that. Oh so yes, that there were many people helped. That's what, one of the reasons that I went as well, because I felt that so many non-Jewish people were helping, you know, and did a, did a beautiful job. I felt I, I, it was my duty to do it as well. Okay. And on the 6th of, this, of September, they transported us to Ravensburg. We all had to queue up to go in a big queue to the train, but I thought I'm not going, I, so I hid under in matras. But my legs were still outside when the Aufseher ring came and pulled me back again. And then she pushed me into the last wagon, because they were all cattle wagons. And I was put in the last wagon, which was in a way my luck, because there were only about eight people, eight women there. And they had worked in the kitchen, so they had a big tin of food with them. So then we went to Ravensbrück for three days and two nights and arrived there the evening of the 8th. And that was terrible, terrible. Screaming and shouting and dogs and whips. Unbelievable. Thank you, Selma and Bea. To conclude our service, I would now like to welcome back Rabbi Stuart Altshuler to lead us in the Kaddish, which will be followed by Cantor Heller leading the Adan Olam, after which the service will end. Thank you all for joining us today and keep well. Stuart. Yes, please join with me as an affirmation of light, the light of God, Kaddish in memory of the six million. Yit gadal v'yit gadash shemei rabba v'yalmad yivrach yirutei v'yamlich malchutei v'chayechon 
וביומכון ובחיי דכל בית ישראל, בעגלה ובזמן קריב, ואמרו אמן. יהי שמי רבה מברך לעולם דומה על מאיה, יתברך וישתבח, ויתפאר ויתרומם ויתנשא, ויתהדר ויתעלה ויתהלל, שמי דקודשה בריכו. ואלה מן כל ברכתה ושירתה, תושבחתה ונחמתה, דם איראן ימה ואמרו אמן. יהי שלמה רבה מן שמיא וחיים עלינו ועל כל ישראל, ואמרו אמן. עושה שלום במרומיו, הוא יעשה שלום. עלינו ועל כל ישראל, ואמרו אמן. Adonai Lam Asher Malach Beterem Kol Yetzir Nivra Lehet Nasah Mehef Tzokol Azai Melech Shemo Nikra Meacharei Kichlot Akol Levado Imloch Nora והוא היה, והוא הווה, והוא יהיה בתפארה, והוא אחד ואין שני, להמשילו להכבירה, בלי ראשית, בלי תכלית, ולא ההוס והמשרה. והוא הלי וחי גואלי וצור חבלי בעת צרה והוא ניסי ומנוס לי מנת כוסי ביום אקרא בידו אבקית רוחי בעת אישן והאירה ואם רוחי גביעתי, אדוני לי 